Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from Madison Realty Capital, New York Community Bank, M&T Bank, Amtrust Title, Customers Bank, Ariel Property Advisors, Capital One Bank, Sterling National Bank, Marks Panath LLP, Meridian Capital Group. Additional funding has been provided by grants from Amarant Bank, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, B6 Real Estate Advisors, CBRE, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Mortgage Lending, Citizens Bank, Collins Building Services, CPEX Real Estate Services, Douglaston Development Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handro Properties Handler Real Estate Organization, Hodges Ward Elliott INC, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, John Casamitidis Red Apple Group, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Matone Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Group, RPW Group, SJP Properties, Stonehenge NYC, TD Bank, Terra CRG, the Maringor Family Foundation, and these friends. So, growing up in Brooklyn, we knew that there was Chinese restaurants. And Sunday was the day that you'd go to the Chinese restaurant on Church Avenue, on Flappish Avenue, other, other places. But there was never a subject of a Korean restaurant. And suddenly, in 2019, Korean restaurants are really big things. So with the help of my co-host, executive producer, Drew Nipporin, who is not an owner of a Korean restaurant, no. but who opened up a Japanese restaurant many years ago. Right. Okay. A little place called Nobu. We are talking today about what's happening in the world of Korean foods and what's happening in New York City. So I'm going to let each one of my guests, with the exception of Drew, introduce themselves, tell their background, and how they got into the restaurant business. Douglas Kim. So my name is Douglas Kim. Uh, I'm owner of Chef at Jeju Noodle Bar. And um, I used to work for a little more fine restaurant before. But then I thought that, you know, there's a room for Korean food. But some of the, the restaurants, the finer restaurants, what were they? I mean, I mean, I, work with the Jews, I mean, the pedigree that you have, you know, yeah. is, is top notch, you know. I worked through like 1998, long time ago. At Nobu? Yeah, and then after that, I went CIA. Then I started working. So you went to CIA Culinary Institute of America, right? Then Boule, you know, per se, Chef Table Brooklyn Fair. Uh, then pretty I pretty much worked at all the great restaurants in New York. Yeah, City. right. <laughs> yeah, but the thing is, is like you know, for me, it was I gotta find a way to find my own route, and uh, I think that you know, Korean food was like you know, uh, next thing. Did you ever think you'd open up something? which was Korean food, Korean food oriented? When we met first time in 1998, I still remember that moment. He came to me, I don't know why he knew my name, and he knew I was a Korean. He came up to me, my name is Drew, and one day we're gonna open a Korean restaurant. Uh -huh. That was the first season introductions. So tell me about the Korean restaurant, which recently won a Michelin star. Oh yeah, so we are focused on uh, noodle, uh, and we call you know Korean version of ramen which means it's like, you know, it's like a Japanese ramen, but, you know, we take this, uh, take on in Korean style and we call ramen. And, you know, we have uh, different dishes as well, as well, but thing is like, you know, we are f like literally focused on ramen, but, you know, it's a little more than ramen, I think. It's a little more different than compared to other noodle shop. And, you know, you can come and you come as an experience rather than, you know, 
whole meal. Now, who's coming to your restaurant? That people who live in New York are people here, and then there are the visitors to New York, which is the majority of people who are going to many of the fine restaurants that you just described. Okay, before it was more like, you know, okay, who does, who does this guy work the fine dining restaurant and open ramen shop? Yeah, who's this crazy guy yeah. who left that, right? Yeah, that, that kind of clientele was coming in. But now after we, uh, we got a mission start, the clientele has got so much gap. So people are coming in for just a quick bottle of noodles, but then at the same time, they're coming for a whole experience as well. So the average check is a pretty very different compared to used and, to be. And are they drinking also in addition to eating? Yes. And what do they drink? Is it wine? Wine. We, it? Only, we only have a uh, beer and wine license only. And then uh, before Michelin as well, uh, my wine vendor told me we sell most of wine in New York City as a noodle restaurant. But then after Michelin, you know, this got a little more stable at this moment. So, I mean, like it varies a lot, you know, compared to before. It used to be, okay, the average check was like this much, but now it's like this, it was this much gap. You know, some, some people just boil ramen. Some people spend, you know, a couple hundred dollars. Now, our other Korean restaurateur, chef, wanted to be a physician at one time, correct? Yes. And where were you before? Um, I learned how to cook at Danielle, with Danielle Blood when he actually was living upstairs still at that time. So I saw him every single day. And then after Danielle? After Danielle, um, I wanted to learn Asian food. And the only or the most famous chef at that time in New York was Masa, cooking Asian food, along with Nobu as well, but Tribeca was too far. <laughs> but um, So you, went, you worked at Masa in the time Warner said that? Yes. Um, I wanted to cook Korean food, but there was nobody I could work under. There were no Korean chefs at that time. So while I was working at Masa, and thankfully he loved eating Korean food. And at Masa, we cooked, Korean, uh, we cooked family meal three times a day. Breakfast at 11, lunch at 3.30, and dinner after service at 11. And I ended up making a lot of them because he wanted Korean food. Really? So mm. how did you decide to open up a Korean restaurant in the Hell's Kitchen? Um, you know, you get to a point when you're a cook where you don't want to cook other people's food anymore. Um, I got into this business because I had a, a creative flair. When you're a line cook, you're cooking, there is no outlet for creativity. You are an extension of the chef's mind and fingers. So I wanted to cook my food. I wanted to teach people um, who I was about, and I was a Korean American. And how do you end up in the Hell's Kitchen Times Square neighborhood as a decision to open up your first restaurant? Well, I was I living mean, there, we, okay. um, and I was walking to work the Time Warner Center. Um, there was a chicken place, Yakitori Toto, that just opened up. Um, and this was 10 years ago. And it was doing incredible. Um, and so I thought, you know, Hell's Kitchen may be now ready for uh, an ingredient-based, a good restaurant that, a good casual restaurant that was affordable, uh, but still used very good ingredients. Now, your second technique. restaurant... Second restaurant I opened seven years ago now. It's Hanjan. And, and the reason why I opened Hanjan is because, you know, Danji still is a very Korean-American interpretive restaurant. I was intimidated to cook traditional Korean food and only traditional Korean food 10 years ago because we were not in K-Town or Koreatown. But after having worked at Danji, the menu started becoming more traditional. I wanted to be more authentic, which is a bad word these days, but I wanted to cook food, not maybe from my generation, but my parents' generation, because that was the foundation for all of us. So here, here's the question. How did the guy who grew up in Stytown or Peter Cooper Village, I always get that. Peter Cooper. Peter Cooper Village, decide to go in and open up a Japanese restaurant? <laughs> well, I mean, because of the Tribeca Grill in 1990, Robert De Niro had come to me and he tried to cast uh, Nobu Matsuisa as the chef of Tribeca Grill, which was obviously an example of bad casting. 
but we were very uh, cordial to Nobu, and I noticed this amazing friendship between Nobu and Robert De Niro. So when the corner availed itself on the corner of Hudson and Greenwich, Hudson and uh, uh, North uh, Franklin, I'm sorry, uh, right away I thought this would be a perfect vehicle. But why, me. I mean, Nobu, you had met, you knew that he was a craft craftsman, yeah. a wonderful chef, but uh, because I'm trying to put, it's Nobu, a very good uh, well, Nobu had analogy a, if we're playing well, in this situation. It, you, you it is a good analogy. Okay, yeah. you be, because you were before your time on that. Yeah, well. Okay, people didn't know the same it, way that the two of you have done it. Here's the best analogy. People in New York City had not a clue uh, about Japanese uh, cuisine. The restaurants up until that moment because it was 25 years ago, um, the Japanese restaurants were geared to the Japanese that were living in New York City. So what, what's happened over the, those 25 years is literally an education. People do want to learn about cooking. And the correlation to what they're doing is, I noticed you know, probably about a dozen years ago that there were these young Korean cooks working in all my kitchens. And I was like, you know, and then David Chang emerged, Momofuku, but they weren't necessarily cooking Korean food. There were elements of it, but then now, let's just say uh, they're embracing the cooking of Korea, and, and I think it's a similar process, that people are going to the restaurants because they want to try to understand the cuisine. Okay, and I think that's very important because Nobu was a, a creative, was a it was a pinnacle. It was a bit a of fusion, pinnacle. too. It was a fusion. Okay, and you both, okay, have come from different worlds, and now you've gone to your own roots, or as they would say. How important is it to be in Koreatown to have a Korean restaurant? Because how many, restaurant, how many Korean restaurants are in Koreatown? A lot. I mean, well, I thought about that a long time already, because if there's a two reasons why I stay away from a Koreatown. The one is a rent. So I think that you know, their lease term is pretty short as well. And then the rent is horrendous. And then for them to make it with their investment, they have to turn and burn very quickly. And then when you understand the restaurant margin you know, recently is very thin. So there's a certain budget you can run, but you know, where you're gonna find the extra budget to pay the rent is most of the time is a food cost. So, but what there's happens a reason, is... There's a reason why on the strip of 32nd Street where there are 50 Korean restaurants, there isn't a single Korean chef. If I don't know of is, any. I don't know of any. You know so of any? Who's, well, so who's, uh, who's Dookie, cooking? Dookie Line. got a little bit of notoriety. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you have line chefs? You mean? Uh, with, with... So what do we have? Spanish oh, it's, chefs? It's, it's ownership, right? The owner, it's ownership. the ownership. The chef changes every six months. Um, Probably a lot of illegals. A lot of illegals, a lot of Koreans coming temporarily from Korea and then leaving after six months. Now, who's and, and can I just make this point that Koreatown, like Chinatown, is geared for the Koreans. What they're doing is geared for everybody. They're trying to really appeal to a mass So what, what is, if you had to say, what's your typical customer? So... When I worked at Nobu a long time ago, 1998, the, what, what I seen was, was something that amazed me was, back then, I was thinking in my head, why this restaurant is so packed every day? And I see celebrities and left and right every day. And it was because of Drew. Uh, <laughs> I mean, for that reason, but you know, I think it's like, why can we Korean restaurant have like this kind of atmosphere? I thought about it for a very long time. And then, me being Korean itself, I'm, not, I'm sure probably like a lot of chefs disagree, but you know, Korean people are very stubborn. So they would like to feed you what are they you like. Are you saying that your buddy over here is stubborn? No, no, I'm <laughs> not, everybody's have a different you know, aspect of, of approaching, right? So I, for me it was like, okay, what I learned from the novel was like, okay, I gotta make Korean food that what, you know. A certain high quality. Yeah, and that then. people are gonna come back to. That that there's a notoriety. And a little more accessible, you know? If I give you like, you know, three years old kimchi to people who never kimchi before, they're not gonna like it. So I try to make a little more toned down version of it. Will you sense. increase the, 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 your menu assortment now? Well, the, oh. the, the noodles that 
are the centerpiece of his. Right, the noodles are the centerpiece. You know, yeah. that's the most popular item, but he changes his menu quite frequently. Yes, and then uh, nowadays it's not about how you want to cook. It's about what cook can produce your cook's food. It is you more find that to be the case? Um, we have d both restaurants. We've dumbed down the menu. We have to. The cooks just aren't good enough. They don't stay long enough. For me, when I was cooking, when yeah. we were cooking, one year to learn, second year to really understand. And you stayed at a restaurant for two years because you wanted to learn, so, absorb. So, you know, they don't do that Talk about days. Koreatown. Mm -hmm. Okay, Chinatown still has its restaurants that people go to. You have the Chinese go there and the travelers, visitors, and New Yorkers go to the restaurants. What about Flushing, where you have all these different dialects, different communities, and thousands of restaurants? What do you see? In, how about opening up a is, Korean is, restaurant in Flushing? No, no, but uh, the, the analogy to Flushing is Fort Lee. Yes. Am I right? Because uh, in Fort Lee, there's quite a lot of... Palisades Park. Palisades Park. Right, but that's where a lot of Koreans live. Live, uh-huh. Okay, that's no, but the, there are a lot of Korean restaurants. The, but that's the reason, because people live, you know, live, uh, and that's where they eat. Okay, that's why Fort so Lee and Palisades Park. I, I, I sort of understand where you're going at. Um, I think it's different in Korea in that Korea itself, we don't have a history, a long history of restaurants. So even now, when you want to have the best meal in Korea, you don't go to a restaurant. You don't go to a Korean restaurant. You go to somebody else's home. Um, in this country and in many, many European countries, the best ingredients from the farms, they go to restaurants because it's more consistent. Not in Korea. In Korea, it goes to the supermarkets where the rich families shop. Traditionally, the best chefs in Korea are the mothers and the grandmothers who have passed down generation after generation with their recipes. Um, Korean restaurants still don't have that sort of traditional is there Korean a need? home food. Okay, okay. Simon, as he, as we said, he believes he opened up a steakhouse, which is a <laughs> barbecue. Okay, your noodles. Okay, you're full Korean. Mm -hmm. Is there a need for more? I don't want to use the per se or the Danielle world. Is there a need for f fine quality Korean food? Or can we take the second line, which you just brought up, about the Koreatown restaurants mm -hmm. on the 32nd Street? The food is okay, but it's not great because the chefs, there's no consistency and so on. You know, I feel the best restaurants are such because the chef's personality comes out. Oh. Jungshik in Tribeca, he bleeds fine dining. Yeah. And, and yeah. he, to him, it's, he cooks traditional Korean fine dining food. Um, many Koreans will not agree with him, but Jungshik is great because it comes from the chef's ideas, his values, his beliefs. But I, you know, I'm, I'm listening, but I'm, I have two master chefs over here. Are you still in the kitchen? Are yes. Are you still cooking? Every Are day. Are you still cooking? Yes. So I think it's a more bigger question is you got to uh, narrow it down. What do you want to do with the Korean cuisine? Are you trying to make a little next, like next Japanese cuisine? Or you just want to serve Korean who lives here? For me, I choose to be, you know, serve what nobody did before. So I want to make Korean food to be a little bigger and, you know, more global. And I think that's the more, like, target that you got to find, like, er, like, you know, find it. It's like, am I serving Korean or am I serving, you know? And that's where we disagree, yeah. respectfully. Yeah. But for me, I believe the best way to promote Korean food is to promote the authentic flavors. Um, so Douglas doesn't serve three-year kimchi because his clientele will be a little offended by yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. aroma. We do. We age our kimchi. It's not three years, but we do serve year and eight months now. You know, 18 months fermented. Because I, I believe that... Um, New York City is now ready for advanced Korean food. And what do you, master restaurateur, believe? What's your thoughts about well, Korean I, food and eat? Honestly, I think it's a learning process. I'm still learning. I think it's inescapable in general. People don't want the fine dining. Uh, they don't want all the rituals of fine dining. They don't want the expense of fine dining. 
his prices are very fair, and he's not fine dining. And 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 actually, you know, Douglas comes from places that charge incredible prices, like Brooklyn Fair. You were at Zuma, and now his prices are, you know, uh, you know, very inexpensive. So I I think they're educating this next generation towards you yeah, know, like educating the next generation of what. Customers or chefs? No, when they go both. to their restaurants, they're they're eating wonderful food, but they're learning about the culture. They're learning about the whole, the whole thing, and it, they're expanding, you know, their their knowledge. Yeah, but then I think is we just going different directions. But at the end, it's the same goal. I think, you know, he's going to a little more authentic way. For me, is a little more easier to for them to understand. And then, uh, but ultimately, I think we're shooting for same goal, right? Yeah, uh, I want Korean to be, you know, Korean food to be a little more. Noticeable. Mm. Do you believe that there is a, a possibility that Korean food or Korean restaurants could do well in the other boroughs? Um, I think Brooklyn has its share of Korean restaurants. Queens, that's where all Asians live. So I think Flushing um, has probably the most authentic, not in the ingredient driven, chef driven restaurants that we do, but Right. I don't believe Flushing has the chef quality. Yes. As you would have in the other Korean restaurants that you'd have in Manhattan. But it does have very authentic diner quality Korean food. What about in, in, uh, in Korea? Are there schools? Are there For, culinary schools? Yes. Yeah. It's a but major. Are they cooking? Uh, are they teaching the Korean? Uh, Back, back in the days when I used to cook, you know, nobody wanted to learn Korean food. Yeah. <laughs> right. But now it's all of a sudden everybody wants to learn Korean. Well, that was, that was the, see, the thing was that the, these guys were all working in, like, Danielle and, and uh, Nobu, and now they're not afraid to cook with the Korean ingredients. How did you decide to become a chef? Uh, I think it was decided for me. <laughs> you know, I was still in medical school. I took a year off. You went to medical school yes. for a year? Yes. Uh-huh. I took a year off because I hated hospitals. <laughs> it just made me sick. So I took a sabbatical and I went to FCI, French Culinary Institute at uh, that time, yeah. ICC now. Uh, it was a nine month course. And while I was there, I interned at Tocqueville and crew Chez Galant. Oh, okay. uh, and you know, the, the moment where I decided to become a chef was when you know, everybody wear, wears whites in the kitchen as well as hospitals. These chefs look so much more studly than the doctors. I wanted to be not a doctor, but I wanted to be a chef. And how did you decide to become a chef? I think uh, it wasn't choose to be. Um, I was like, I wanted to be more business person. And then I was looking into business college and things like that. But then um, I think uh, when I was went, I was an international student, and then this IMF, the, the Korean economy, went down very hard. And, you know, then parents told me that, okay, you got to make a living with yourself. And somehow, I don't know, I just, one day I woke up, I was working in the kitchen. But then, after working for that Nobu, I'm, I'm, I'm saying a lot of Nobu, but after seeing that scene, I saw the future that, wow, this is a, something different scene never seen it before. So uh, you bring up the word future. Where is the future in the Korean cooking and the Korean restaurant business in New York and around the nation? Your thoughts? Um, the past five years, we've had a lot of Korean born chefs um, open restaurants that may not be traditional, but they're opening personal restaurants, food that they like to eat. And even though it may not be Korean um, traditional, but it is Korean inspired because that's who they are. And the more of these personal restaurants that open up, I think just better quality of restaurants in general. And those have to be considered either Korean inspired or Korean restaurants because of the, because who the chef is. And then the more of those restaurants there are, the better it is for Korean cuisine. Douglas? I think uh, we're at the, like, you know, prime time, but you know, I. I think that we need to be a little more, you know, push harder. And then um, obviously, you know, Korean food is getting a little more popular, but my personal opinion somewhere, not New York, is a little not popular, at, you, you know, as New York. Drew? Well, you know, my chef now at the Tribeca Grill for a better part of a year is Brenton Lee, who's half Korean, half Chinese. 
So um, the one thing I would say is they're very serious about what they do. Huni, especially talking about personality, that's what it's all about in a restaurant. You know, the, the fish stinks from the head, basically. Whoever's running, you know, who's ever calling the shots, creating the standards. But, but you know what? How important is it for you, being owners and chefs of Korean restaurants, to touch your table and touch your customers? Very. Are you out there meeting with your customers, sitting with your customers, talking to your Much customers? Much more so now. We, I always believe that we talk through our food. But these days, that's not enough. <laughs> so, he, yeah. They're, they're, you know, they're shy. They're not always in the dining room. Uh, him? He, he, when he, you know, Douglas is very smart and he can articulate everything. But, you know, I know in his own restaurant, he's very shy. All right? and, but at least Douglas has an open kitchen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Both of my kitchens are closed because I don't believe. Right, so his kitchen's downstairs. Oh, he has an open yeah. upstairs, though. Yeah. Most of the time, I'm actually looking at the everywhere. But I try to go to table, and then because we do some table side service, and then we, I mean, if I have an opportunity, I'd like to go to table and then explain about the dishes. And then, uh, but I'm a pretty shy person at when it comes to, you know, promoting myself and sometimes so. But you may be shy, but I have had two of the best Korean chefs in Korean restaurants to here, and the restaurant impresario <laughs> of, the, of the world over here. I'd like to thank Douglas, Moonjay, and Drew, and I'll see you next week.